Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Back with another case study for today. And if you're into storm chasing or you're into severe weather, you have heard of this event. And it was actually the event that first piqued my interest in severe weather. And that is the May 3rd, 1999 Oklahoma tornado outbreak that included the Bridge Creek Moore EF5 that produced the strongest wind gusts ever recorded in a tornado pictured here on the screen. This was a pretty prolific outbreak. Uh, 58 tornadoes occurred just in the National Weather Service Normans County Warning Area. In total, 69 tornadoes occurred on May 3rd from just 10 different supercells. So these storms were extremely efficient at producing tornadoes in a cyclic fashion. Of course, you have your Bridge Creek to Moore, Oklahoma tornado, long track F5 tornado. You can see the instances of F5 damage there in Bridge Creek and in the south southern part of the Oklahoma City metro area. A, another infamous tornado from this outbreak was the Mohal F4 tornado that occurred after dark, pictured here. Now, there are some rumors that this tornado was actually stronger than the Bridge Creek Moore tornado, but it was only rated e, um, F4, uh, but it was a beast nonetheless. So, before we get started here, I want to draw your attention to a couple of articles here. First, we have this uh, database from the National Weather Service, Norman, with all of whatever you'd want to know about this outbreak here, um, and that is the source of this picture that I showed first. Then a couple of articles here. This first one here is was written by the entire uh, Storm Prediction Center crew, and it talked about all the different challenges that they faced when forecasting this event. We'll get into those here in a second. But really interesting article there. I'll be referring to this article throughout the video. And this one as well from Rich Thompson and Roger Edwards over at the SPC. This one goes into more of the environmental conditions and the overall progression of the outbreak. I'll be, re be referring to this one as well, and I'll put the links to these journal articles in the description box below. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just a note before we go in, before we dive in here, a lot of the products that you'll see in this video are going to be different than what we normally use for our case studies and forecast discussions. Um, of course, this outbreak occurred in 1999, and the data archives that I use, um, either you know the SPC mesoanalysis page, the UCAR site for, for radar, satellite, and surface data, etc., those either don't go back far enough to cover this event, or if they do go back far enough, often the data was incomplete. So we're going to be using a few different products here, but the information will be the same nonetheless. And we'll start out here with our upper air pattern here at 500 millibars from Tornado Archive. Excellent website if you're looking to do some research on past tornado cases. So let's take a look here at the 500 millibar pattern. You can see right off the bat, pretty big trough here descending down the west coast with a little sort of a short wave out in front of the main trough extending into the desert southwest into the southern plains here well ahead of the main wave and this would kind of enter the southern plains here by the afternoon you can see a little bit of a kink in the iso or the height contours there signifying that short wave entering the plains of course we like to look at 700 millibars for short waves but this will definitely make do you can see the short wave right in there as well with some enhanced flow impinging into the uh, you know Texas Panhandle Western Oklahoma vicinity by the afternoon on May 3rd. And one of the first challenges that forecasters faced with this event was how the models were portray portraying this shortwave and how it would eject into the Southern Plains. If we take a look at our um, Edwards et al. 2002 article, we will take a look at figure uh, 6C and D here. Now, let me zoom in here so you can see a little bit better. This first figure here is the observed 500 millibar winds on uh, at, at 7 p.m. on May 3rd, 1999. And the values you'll see here are the forecast error from the ADA model. The ADA model is basically the equivalent of the North American or NAM model that we use today. So if you see negative values here, that means that the wind speeds were under forecast by the model. Of course, that has implications on the strength of the trough coming in and the overall wind shear in the atmosphere and the degree of forcing impinging into the region. And you can see here that the ADA model was significantly underdoing wind speeds across the Southern Plains in particular. You can see errors of minus 10 to 15 there uh, knots across Oklahoma. So the strength of the trough was being very much um, under forecast and the wind speeds aloft were very much under forecast here. And that had d d significant implications on the forecast process here. Now this one 
is our geopotential height contours valid um, on with the air and the error valid on May 3rd 1999 at 7 p.m. so as we talked about these are geopotential height contours we talked about that in our Joplin case study basically all the geopotential height is is the height of a constant pressure surface above mean sea level so if you were to look straight ahead at the 500 millibar pressure surface it would look like kind of a sheet with with peaks and valleys and the distance above mean sea level at a given point of the 500 millibar sheet so to speak is the geopotential height and so as we said in the Joplin video we want to see lowering heights or height falls in order for that um, signification of low pressure taking over and the resultant rising motion would be favorable for storm initiation in a given environment so the positive values here in this map are over forecast geopotential heights at 500 millibars and you can see all across the region that the geopotential heights here were being significantly over forecast meaning that the strength of the trough was being extremely underdone on the model so right off the bat forecasters were having a very difficult time discerning whether or not this trough would eject in a manner such that would um, initiate severe storms properly um, given a kind of moist unstable environment they SBC day two outlook was a slight risk here you can see on the figure here this dark contour is the slight risk for the 1730 Z day two outlook on May 2nd slight risk extending from eastern Kansas down into Texas so there was some semblance that there was going to be a severe weather event across the southern plains but not really any signs of a significant severe weather event to kind of go on top of the forecast issues with the models here this is a another figure from Edwards et al 2002 and you can see some different runs here of the ruck model very inconsistent in forecasting convective precipitation here you can see some runs that do forecast precipitation there in southwest Oklahoma other runs that are completely dry so the run to run consistency with the models was very very um, questionable and very very poor which was giving forecasters a difficult time in discerning the severe weather potential for May 3rd let's another issue with this trough more so on the day of the event is that it was producing a thick band of cirrus clouds starting in the southwest and moving into the southern plains now this is our satellite data here and of course as I said this is not our normal source of satellite data we don't really have a zoomed in view of the southern plains uh, with this satellite view but it's the best I could find here is the data was was fairly incomplete keep your eye on this region right in here that's gonna be your Texas Oklahoma region right in there and remember our trough was ejecting into the plains and I want you to keep an eye on that area notice this band of cirrus clouds that was thickening and moving off toward the northeast into the southern plains of course we want to see we want that full solar heating full surface heating from the Sun in order to maximize instability let that instability build and erode the cap fully and there was some some thoughts on the morning of this event as this cirrus band continued to move northeast that this may hinder surface heating enough to that storms may not even fire I want to bring your attention here to these status messages from vortex 99 as you know the vortex project began in the mid 90s and was a multi-agency multi-instrument field project that tried to study tornadoes at close range from multiple different angles and there was a kind of spin-off of, of the original vortex project in conjunction with the University of Oklahoma here in 1999 called vortex 99 and every morning uh, and every day the leaders of the project doctors Eric Rasmussen and Jerry Straka from the NSSL and University of Oklahoma would post status messages basically forecasts for the day and any days beyond the current uh, storm chase day and I want you to want you to note here this morning message from 1023 a.m. on May 3rd 99 Pr uh, there was quite a bit of skepticism in the overall environment here notice what they say here today's forecast problem concerns location of the dry line and its ability to initiate storms it's not clear th that convergence will be very strong along it and we'll talk about that in a second as well and th this line is is kind of uh, interesting looking back although supercells are likely tornadoes are not so likely no forecast of strongly back surface winds so the combination of the model inconsistencies the cirrus moving in 
which was noted in the an upcoming um, message here at 11.45 a.m., a growing and thickening plume of CI or cirrus is forming over New Mexico and infecting northeast. Currently, this plume has a south edge, which appears to be near the jet maximum on, maximum on the profile network. As upper flow backs over the next several hours, this cirrus should head toward western Oklahoma and Kansas, possibly reducing insulation enough to prevent or delay initiation. So they were not even sure, based on the model inconsistencies, the thick cirrus deck that was impinging into the region and the lack of convergence along the dry line, that storms were even going to fire. That was still in question the morning of the event. Now let's go back here to our satellite data. And you can even see it a little bit better here on the this infrared satellite imagery. This was a very thick band of cirrus, and this was at 3 p.m. on May 3rd, 1999, prior to storm initiation. Very thick cirrus, cirrus overcast here that was really casting some doubt on storm initiation. But I want you to look there near the Red River. Take a look at the kind of gap in the cirrus right there. A few, di a few breaks in the cirrus right there. And if we zoom in to our satellite view here, you can see a couple of things. You can really see that gap in the cirrus right there, just south of the Red River, extending into southwest Oklahoma. First attempts at convective initiation here, some cumulus here just after 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time. These would not survive as they moved into southwest Oklahoma. We would have additional storm development in southwest Oklahoma, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this cirrus gap was was turning out to be just enough to allow storms to fire and not hinder surface heating too much to where the cap would not fully erode. I want to also bring to your attention these kind of cloud streets out here across the western half of Oklahoma, very prominent here, especially in southern Oklahoma. You can see the, the clouds kind of organized in little bands right there. Those are called cloud streets or billow clouds. And that is a classic sign of stable air and a capping inversion still in place. So there was a little bit of capping in remaining, but it would not be um, enough to stop storms from firing in the next few hours after this satellite image here. You can see we move on a couple hours. That gap translates northeast into southwest Oklahoma, the gap in the cirrus there, and we get those initial storms kind of died off and we got um, renewed development out here ahead of the dry line in southwest Oklahoma, and that storm would eventually become the Bridge Creek Moore tornado producer, and we'd be, we would get additional development to its west out there in that cirrus gap. So that is that, those were a couple of the main issues with the overall setup. Let's take a look at our surface data now. Actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and look at the rest of our upper air charts. So, of course, we have, again, our 500 millibar trough, our shortwave trough swinging into the plains there with some nice difluence aloft. We don't have the 300 millibar map to really diagnose divergence aloft, but you can kind of see it here at the 500 millibar map. Some nice uh, divergence aloft here across the southern plains with that short wave moving in. Um, and so let's go to 850 millibars here, take a look at our low level jet. We'll back it up here. So at 12Z, we had a nice low level jet centered across much of the plains extending all the way up to the can Canadian border there. Southern Plains, low-level jet, about 30, 40, 45 knots there, helping to uh, continue to pump that moisture in from the south. We go forward with time, and we get kind of Lee cyclogenesis there on the west side of the Rockies, or the east side of the Rockies, excuse me. Of course, as we know, as that trough moves, its, that 500 millibar trough moves its way, that flow goes over the Rockies we get surface low development, low level cyclone to develop on the east side of the Rockies. And that's exactly what we had here. Low level cyclone developing there up in the Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska vicinity and in turn the low level flow strengthened. And we had a nice increase in the low level jet throughout the day across the southern plains. Let's take a look at our surface data now. We'll go back in time here. So the morning of the event 60s dew points all the way up into central Kansas here. Large swath of, dew, of, of nice low level moisture there to the south. 70s dew points confined there to south and south central Texas. And again, throughout the day, we got surface low development up there in kind of the Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska vicinity right in there. And that helped continue to pull that moisture northward, strengthen and kind of back the surface winds and really pump that moisture northward in the low levels. You can see 70s dew points all the way up there to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, 60s dew points there across much of Oklahoma. Now let's take a closer look here at our surface map. 
So again, this is a different source than we usually use. This is Plymouth State Weather Center surface map. The UCAR uh, surface data was not complete for this event. So we're going to have to use this Plymouth State Weather Center. But the information is there nonetheless. So here we are at 12Z on May 3rd, so the morning of the 3rd. You can see mid-60s dew points all the way up there to the Dallas-Fort Worth area with kind of low to mid-60s across much of Oklahoma there, including southwest Oklahoma. Easy to pick out kind of the dry line. 40s dew points, low 40s dew points there near Amarillo in the Texas Panhandle. 58 dew point there at Childress, uh, low 60s there in the southwest Oklahoma vicinity. So the dry line was kind of somewhere in this vicinity on the morning of May 3rd, 99. So we went through the day. Let's go to 20Z here. And you're going to have to look closely for this. This is a, it was a very complex situation at the surface that was evolving. And I'm going to show the um, analysis from Thompson and Edwards 2000 here in a second, their analysis of the surface pattern. But we can see a few things from our surface map here. So first of all, you see 43 degree dew points there at, I believe that's Gage or Shattuck. I'm not 100% sure, but 43 dew point there, 48 at Amarillo, 39 there to the north. And then a 56 dew point there at... Um, Childress, Texas. So the main dry line was likely somewhere in this vicinity here. But I want you to focus here on southwest Oklahoma. Childress at 56 degrees, dew point with, uh, dew point with a wind out of the southwest. And then you had a kind of south-southwesterly wind here and dew points in the mid-60s here in southwest Oklahoma. So there was actually a secondary dry line that was located somewhere in here that was also analyzed by Thompson and Edwards. And so this was a very interesting kind of dual dry line structure here. You had your main dry line with, with significant dew point uh, changes across the boundary. And this one was not your typical dry line, not your typical sort of you know strong moisture change across the dry line, but it was definitely enough of a boundary there to signify it as a secondary dry line. I want to also bring your attention here, this area in southwest Oklahoma into north Texas. Notice here at this um, wind barb here, I believe that is Lawton or Fort Sill there. Um, 83 over 68 there with a kind of south southeasterly wind. South southwesterly wind here at Frederick, 85 over 66. Down here in, into far north Texas, south southwesterly wind here, and a south southeasterly wind here at Ardmore, Oklahoma. So there was some sort of confluence boundary located right in here, extending from southwest Oklahoma into north Texas. And we'll talk about that in a second, whether or not that initiated storms or not. But there was definitely a complex situation here at the surface. Multi two different dry line boundaries here and a confluence band here entering into southern Oklahoma. And I'll show you the 20Z surface map from Thompson and Edwards 2000. You can see much of the same as we analyzed here. Main dry line out there to the west across the southeast Texas panhandle into western Oklahoma. Secondary dry line here in the southwest Oklahoma, and then your your confluence boundary here, this brown dashed line extending all the way into north Texas, from, uh, from north Texas into southwest Oklahoma. So very complex surface pattern here. And let's take a look at the um, convergence along the dry line. That was one of the, the per, perhaps negative factors um, that might inhibit storm formation was the lack of convergence along these dry line boundaries. Notice here, South southwesterly winds or southwesterly winds to the uh, west of the dry line, much of the same to the east of the dry line. So this main dry line was not all that convergent. Same thing here with the this kind of westernmost dry line. Winds out of the south southwest here, maybe very slight confluence along that. Of course, with a dry line, we we want to see something like that. Winds to the west of that dry line out of the southwest, more more backed winds to the east of that. So we have nice converging flow along that dry line that more easily gets storms to fire. These dry lines were not that convergent at all. So there was a question whether these dry lines would provide a focus for storm development at all, given the overall subtle forcing as well, modeled uh, by models like the Ada and the Ruck models. So very complex surface analysis there. And so let's talk about storm initiation here. We'll go to our uh, let's go back to our satellite here. Of course, we saw this is at 3.45 p.m. Here is our eventual Bridge Creek Moore storm. And we start to get very robust development in that kind of cirrus gap across southwest Oklahoma there. Very robust cumulonimbus there as that, that cirrus gap moved toward the northeast. 
and you can see that those those billow clouds started to erode out ahead of that storm so that low level stability was not su not a super big concern. We also had additional storms fire out here in far southwest Oklahoma near the Red River there and this would become storm B as labeled in Thompson and Edwards and uh, in the NWS Norman uh, damage surveys this would be the eventual Mulhall tornado producer. So storms began to fire at, you know after 3 p.m. here and let me pull up the um, radar data here. So this is at Starting at 4.15 p.m., you can see the first blips there in southwest Oklahoma. And interestingly enough, these did not form along that easternmost dry line or the confluence boundary. I want to bring to your attention here figure 14 in Thompson and Edwards 2000 here. Now, this is, of course, in black and white, so it might make it a little bit harder to pick out here. But notice this is the reflectivity plot from the Frederick radar at 20Z just after 3 p.m. on May 3rd, 1999. What they have outlined here is a possible horizontal convective roll. You can see that fine line there, right there in southwest Oklahoma on the radar. Now you can, couldn't really see anything on satellite, but radar was picking up this fine line here, and they've labeled this as a possible horizontal convective roll. And all horizontal convective roll is is, think of it as you're throwing a football in the atmosphere. And of course, you have a perfect spiral. And that horizontally oriented sort of, you know, rotating mass is your horizontal convective roll. It is, it has a lot of spin in it, and you can actually foster storm development from these horizontal convective rolls, and that, that spin can be tilted into the vertical pretty easily, and that can, you know, foster tornadic supercells. So this was what appears that the initial storm that eventually became the Bridge Creek Moore storm formed on. So if we go back to our surface data here, we'll use the Thompson and Edwards one just for ease of access here. So here is our easternmost dry line. Here's our confluence band. The horizontal convective roll was somewhere right in here. So it, the dry line and the confluence band were not the actual initiating boundary for the, um, the at least the initial storm that would go on to produce the Moore tornado. But it would move uh, it would move to the east of that confluence band and then go into a very favorable environment for tornadic supercells. Let's go ahead and look at some soundings here. So we'll start off at 12Z, the observed 12Z sounding at Norman. You can see a pretty classic loaded gun sounding here. Nice deep moist layer up to about 850 millibars here with a stout elevated mixed layer layer above that moist layer. Now, of course, we've talked about the EML a lot on this channel. The EML is that layer of steep lapse rates and dry, warm air that emanates near the surface in the desert southwest or in the higher terrain off to the west and gets transported off to the east over this moist layer in the plains, and that can help cap the atmosphere and allow instability to build before it erodes in the afternoon for an explosive convective development. You can see where this, um, this elevated mixed layer came from. Here's the 12Z Amarillo sounding from May 3rd, and you can see a very stout elevated mixed layer there just above the surface at Amarillo that was transported off toward the east. So very stout capping inversion in place, but kind of a loaded gun look here. One thing about the wind profile, of course, we were having the issues with the models, very significant kind of veer back signature, lots of backing, weak, very weak flow in the mid-levels here from eight, about near about 700 millibars. And of course, forecasters were not sure that that would... would um, adjust itself throughout the afternoon as that we were having, they were having issues with the the models portraying how they were portraying that trough ejection but by 18z we started to get a little bit of that to straighten itself out interestingly enough it uh, photographs almost shortened a little bit you can see not a very long photograph here only about 43 knots of effective bulk shear with only about 114 just over 100 meters square per second squared of storm relativity. Not a whole lot of curvature in the low levels there at 18Z, but we had kind of eroded the cap here, and we're continuing still a little bit of that left over, but we were you know, quickly eroding the cap um, as evidenced by those billow clouds and then them kind of, uh, kind of uh, dissipating. But the moist layer had deepened somewhat by early afternoon. You can see it extends above 850 millibars there. Still some evidence of that elevated mixed layer there and some capping in the atmosphere. So, interestingly enough, let's let's look at the profiles around initiation. This so going back to the how the models were handling this event. This is the ADA model 
forecast hodograph from the evening run on May 2nd valid for 0Z on the May 4th, which would be 7 p.m. on May 3rd. So this was the hodograph forecast for the when the severe weather event was ongoing. And you can see it's not all that favorable for even supercells. Not a very long hodograph here. You can see bulk shear, 0 to 6 kilometer of shear of only about 30 knots. That's kind of on the margins for even supercells. We like to see that 35, 40, 45 plus knots of bulk shear to really um, you know, ensure that supercells are going to happen. We're only seeing about 30 knots here from 0 to 6 kilometers. That's very much on the margins for even supercells. Very kind of small looking hodographs here. Some curvature in the low levels, but low level 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity only at 65 meters squared per second squared. So not a whole lot of low level and deep layer shear to speak of on the model runs. And the models were also predicting kind of a more high precipitation supercell mode, our storm relative outflow. That's kind of, we draw a vector from our storm motion vector to the hodograph generally at or at and above six kilometers above ground level. And we like to see that kind of above 40 knots for kind of a, a low precipitation, classic to low precipitation supercell. And the less that is, the more likely it is for high precipitation storms. And that was the case here. Not a very, not very strong storm relative outflow. And also some of the soundings were showing, um, the, some of the forecast soundings were showing kind of a kind of weak winds aloft. This was even the observed 12Z sounding here. Only 30 knots or so at about 500 millibars. And that was uh, kind of clues that these storms might be a little bit more high precipitation uh, than classic. But that would change pretty quickly. This was the Frederick, Oklahoma wind profiler at 20Z, uh, 2042Z, so just before 4 p.m. on May 3rd as storms were going up. You can see overall a very straight line photograph here for the most part, especially up to about four or five kilometers. Not much curvature in the low levels, and this, of course, would favor more splitting supercells. If we look at our radar image, we go forward in time here. So there's our initial, there's our initial um, that storm that would become the Moore storm. You can see a couple of splits there, and our storm that fired at Storm B here that would become the Mulhall tornado producer. Both of these split. You can see a well-defined right split and a left split here. The left split going off toward the north. The right split would take over and take advantage of what environment there was um, in place across central Oklahoma. And that environment would rapidly um, take shape throughout the afternoon. This is the Purcell, Oklahoma wind profiler at 23Z. So Purcell just south of Norman, just south of the Oklahoma City metro area. At, this is at 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time. And we can see that the model forecasts were extremely underdoing the amount of deep layer shear and low level shear as well. 48 knots of 0 to 6 kilometer shear. That's about almost 20 knots greater than what the models were forecasting. So no wonder that the forecasters were having a lot of challenges forecasting the severity of this event. You can see very significant clockwise curvature here in the low levels. If you look at the actual wind profile here, very nice veering in the low levels of those winds uh, in the lowest couple kilometers, zero to two kilometer helicity here, almost 300 meters squared per second squared. So very strong low level shear and deep layer shear in place for supercells and likely tornadic supercells. If we go to zero Z here on the Purcell profiler here, even better, almost 400 meters squared per second squared, zero to two kilometer storm relative helicity and lots of streamwise vorticity. We've talked about this before, streamwise vorticity is when we compare our storm relative winds to our horizontal vorticity vectors. And we so we draw our vector, storm relative wind vector, from our storm motion vector to the hodograph, and then we draw our horizontal vorticity vector perpendicular to the hodograph. And when those two vectors are parallel, you have ample streamwise vorticity that can be ingested by these supercells, which is extremely favorable for tornado production in a in this in a supercell for a supercell in this environment you can see lots of streamlined vorticity there in the low levels there here at zero z on this profiler so just a pretty textbook sort of profile here we'll look at the zero z norman sounding as well and interestingly enough you can see a little bit of capping had kind of come back in here by zero z at norman that eml had kind of built in a little bit more 
um, in across central Oklahoma. And interestingly, if we look at some photos of these tornado tornadic storms as they were initiating, this was one of the supercells. I'm not sure which one it was. This one was the eventual Mulhall tornado producer here. But look how laminar the features are here in the low levels. That is, th we kind of had a perfect recipe for some structure here, and that kind of signifies that they were dealing with some of that low-level stability. The, the way you get well-structured storms is you have forced ascent through this slightly stable layer with ample streamwise vorticity in the low levels, which we had in spades here. So you had air being forced up through this stable layer, taking advantage of the streamwise vorticity. That's how you get your kind of pancake stack structured supercells. And that was what we were having here. But if we look at our, um, our sounding here, our mixed layer convective inhibition only at negative 60 joules per kilogram here, that's, that's pretty tiny and enough for a mature supercell to overcome. And of course, we know that that convective inhibition didn't really have much effect on these storms at all. So we move on with time here, and we eventually get uh, these couple supercells to take over. The Bridge Creek storm here, the Mulhall storm here, both cyclic tornado producers. Lots of left splits moving off toward the north here from the initial activity. And we would continue to get kind of cyclic tornadic supercells here. Multiple other storms here fired throughout the afternoon. And of course the key for this kind of cyclic tornadic supercell production. Of course, we had the, the pretty incredible environment for a cyclic tornadic supercell. Large instability, likely being underdone here. You can see at the 18Z sounding, only 75 degrees there at Norman. Our surface chart at 20Z there, showing temperatures in the low 80s. So likely instability was being underdone with these soundings, but overall a very favorable profile for tornadic supercells here. Lots of streamlined vorticity to be ingested, but the discrete storm mode really had an impact on the longevity and severity of these storms. The subtle forcing from the 500 millibar trough, although it was enough to get storms going on when at first it might, it was hypothesized that it might not be enough to initiate storms. Nice subtle forcing. If we go back to our 500 millibar um, map here on Tornado Archive, of course we had just kind of this nice broad sort of southwesterly flow, very kind of low amplitude shortwave out here impinging into the plains. So forcing overall was fairly subtle in the on the synoptic scale. We had our surface boundaries not super convergent, not moving a whole lot. So that was going to be a contributor to very subtle forcing as well. And that was just enough to get storms going, but not enough to... Uh, continue to initiate a lot of storms and, the, and thus the quantity of storms was kept at bay. Also the cirrus deck may have played a role as well. The cirrus deck, if we had full sunshine here we might have gotten more storms to develop in close proximity to each other but we just had that very confined area where that cirrus gap was and it only allowed for a couple of storms to fire here initially and in, in this kind of environment discrete storms are definitely going to be pretty impactful as they were on May 3rd, 99. So a couple last things here. We'll, we'll kind of zoom into the Bridge Creek storm. Of course, just an absolutely textbook look there to the Oklahoma City Bridge Creek storm. Interestingly enough, of course, some of the progs were for more high precipitation supercells, and that really wasn't the case here. We had, you know, very, you know, good visibility with these tornadoes. Of course, here's the Bridge Creek storm very visible. Some of the famous shots from, from people like Val Castor show the entire mesocyclone was call, carved out and you could really see it. If we look at our hodograph here, and maybe the um, the Purcell hodograph might be a little bit better. Our storm motion vector out here, of course we've used this kind of proxy before with um, kind of relating the hodograph shape to the actual construction of the storm on radar. Here, so here would be our, our mesocyclone area and precipitation vented off out ahead of this. I think the storm motion was just out away from this precipitation enough to where the precipitation was vented off just enough toward the north to really keep the sort of um, uh, the mesocyclone re region free and clear of any precipitation. Also winds in the mid-levels about 30, 40 knots or so. That's kind of right in the sweet spot. 
based on previous research for your classic supercell storms. So very strong winds aloft tend to produce more low precipitation storms. Weaker winds aloft tend to produce high precipitation storms, and you have kind of a sweet spot there around that 40 knot sort of uh, level there in the mid-levels for your kind of classic supercells, and we kind of fit right into that with these storms. So very potent storm here, of course, moving through the Oklahoma City metro area, just absolutely wrapped up. You can even see here the RFD gust front. This may have been filled with debris as well as it went through Bridge Creek there. Um, and just a very harrowing situation if you were watching this live. Probably some deb debris being sh um, shed there as well from a very, very strong tornado. You can see the velocity here. Just a very strong signature there moving into a very populated area. Not good at all. This is from the TDWR radar at the Oklahoma City Airport there. So just a, an all in all a very uh, impressive event, very uh, harrowing situation, heartbreaking scene if you were watching that live um, with all of these storms moving through populated areas. So we again got continued discrete development throughout the event and then eventually the forcing kind of caught up and we got multiple storms uh, and kind of the mode turned into more of a messy, clustered, almost linear sort of mode as it moved off into uh, the eastern half of Oklahoma overnight. So that's going to wrap things up here for this video. Uh, of course, a very interesting event, and it just shows that some of these event, some of these high end events don't really present themselves until the day of the event. Of course, we've talked about the model inconsistencies. Models were really not showing a, a whole lot with this trough. It was kind of frankly showing it as, as a nothing burger, and the observations quickly became, uh, told the story on the day, the morning of the 3rd, that that was not going to be the case. Stronger, stronger, a little bit stronger forcing, although still subtle, and stronger deep layer shear was definitely uh, becoming a reality on the morning and afternoon of the 3rd. And also that Cirrus deck. You know, usually, if you're storm chasing out here, you, you wouldn't want to see this if you want to see tornadoes, but just enough of that gap in the cirrus deck was enough to continue that surface heating and allow the cap to erode fully there just in southwest Oklahoma for a couple of storms to fire um, amid that kind of subtle forcing regime. So very interesting setup. Um, of course, you know, this is kind of the, the banner outbreak in, in severe storms meteorology for the southern plains. And hopefully this video kind of showed you how that outbreak came to be. So with that, thanks for watching. We will see you in the next video.